Uh, but today we're going to be in Romans chapter 14. And uh, our default here, if you're fairly new, is that we like to go through books of the Bible. We do some topical series, but they're anchored into books of the Bible because God's Word deals with some things that we probably wouldn't deal with if we weren't just going through the whole counsel of God's Word. So today we're going to deal with something that's really important. And I've got a question for you this morning as we start. Have you ever said this, can we all not just get along? Anybody ever said that? I mean, really, can we all not just get along? I was on sabbatical this July with my family, and we were together 24-7, which was a joy. I absolutely love my family. We had my oldest daughter home from Clemson, so we were all together. But every night when we were deciding on what movie to watch, I ended up saying, I mean, really, can we all not just get along? Because some of the nights we didn't watch a movie, and we went to our bedrooms mad because it was so complicated to try to come into an agreement over the right movie. Also received an email this summer from my HOA saying that there was an important meeting that I was invited to where they would be discussing turning the tennis courts into pickleball courts. And I thought, this is a no-brainer. I mean, does anybody play tennis anymore? Like, everybody's into pickleball. Oh, I was wrong. It was like World War III in my neighborhood. And they were just adding pickleball lines. They weren't like converting the whole courts. You could play both, but they're like, no, I don't want to see pickleball when I'm playing tennis. And uh, I read it and rolled my eyes right out of the back of my head. And I thought, can we just not all get along? Now, here's the deal. Some disagreements are trivial and we can resolve them easily by just hugging it out, right? We just hug it out, fist bump, like this is ridiculous. It's not worth it. But how many of you know that some disagreements turn into disunity and disunity turns into division? And the Bible has a lot to say about it because division is nothing new. Our enemy, Satan himself, is the mastermind behind division. Before time began, Lucifer committed a terrible crime in heaven. He not only rebelled against God, but through slander, accusation, and deception, he coerced and convinced a third of the angels to join in this rebellion. And he's up to the same old thing today in 2024. So we have to guard against it. We have to fight for unity because God's will is that we be one just as he and the Father are one. And it takes him to be in unity. We naturally drift towards disunity and division. It's human nature. That's why the longest prayer recorded that Jesus prayed is in John 17. It's called the high priestly prayer of Jesus or the farewell prayer. Just moments before he would give up his life as a ransom to sacrifice himself as the slain lamb of God. He prayed to his father for our unity. And when I read it again this week, I realized a few things. Number one is that unity is only attained by a work of God's grace and the power of his spirit. He commanded us to be one, and then he prayed for us to be one. Why did he pray for us? Because it takes him to be one with each other. It's not natural to walk in unity. It's supernatural. And unity is the predominant sign to the world in which we live that we belong to Christ. We are living in a divided culture. More than any other time in my lifetime, we're divided racially, generationally. We're divided in our gender. We just can't get along. We're divided in our churches. And every time the body of Christ has fractures and divisions, the enemy strikes at the heart of God, which is unity. Psalm 133, listen to what David says about unity. He said, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He didn't just stop there and say, it's just, it's cute. When you guys are united, the Lord just smiles. No, he says, it's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life 
forevermore. When we come into a place of unity, it becomes a catalyst for the anointing of God, the favor and the blessing of God. There is a commanded blessing upon unity in God's house. It matters to God and it should matter to us. Here's the problem. Disunity has always been a struggle for God's people from the very beginning. The Old Testament is filled with stories of civil wars and family fights. Every New Testament church listed in the New Testament had divisions to contend with. The first church council in history, Acts chapter 15, was formed to settle disagreements over what Christians were free to do and not free to do under God's grace. I'm so glad we're over that. We've matured and we don't deal with that kind of stuff anymore. No, I'm kidding. Today we're going to look in Romans chapter 14 and we're going to learn some principles that guide us in fighting for unity. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn again to Romans chapter 14. The believers in the church at Rome were divided. They were divided in two ways, over special diets and special days. Some of the members of the church thought it was a sin to eat meat, and they were only vegetarians. Now, how many of you know that's not God? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know some vegetarians that would throw right up today if you had to eat some meat. But here's the deal. There were divisions over diets. Others thought it was a sin to not observe Jewish holy days. So days and diets were the issues in the church at Rome. When I read that, of course, this isn't my context. This is not my era that I'm living in. But I roll my eyes and I say, really, can we just not all get along? Seems real petty, doesn't it? But here's what I've discovered. Our backgrounds, our traditions, and our personal preferences are powerful. How you were raised, your family of origin what you like and don't like, what gives you goosebumps and repels you, all matters in shaping what you choose to do and not do as a believer. The problem in the church at Rome was not with their convictions. They had them and they should have them. You should have them as well. The problem was that their convictions produced a critical spirit inside of them. Have you ever been around someone with a critical spirit? They're going to find something negative about everything, right? They're going to be judgmental. They're going to skip over the 52 things that are going well, and they're going to find that one thing. They don't just like to question things. They, they have a questioning spirit. You ever been around someone that's just got a questioning spirit? They debate about everything. Well, it's partly cloudy today. Well, I wouldn't say it's partly cloudy. That's what the news says. I'm looking up. It's not fully cloudy. It's partly cloudy. to me. Well, it's actually not partly cloudy. <laughs> now, here's the deal. In the body of Christ, we recognize that people on our row or in our small group are saved, but sometimes we just think they're less spiritual than we are. And that's what was going on in the church at Rome. The Jews and the Gentiles, they recognized that they were saved by grace through faith, but there was a pecking order. And here's the deal. We still find ourselves in these kind of quarrels and disagreements today. It's not necessarily over meat and vegetables, but it's over, over whether or not we're spirit-filled and what do we mean by spirit-filled and do you believe the gifts of the Spirit are still in operation today? Do you feel like they've ceased today? Do you speak in tongues? What does your prayer language sound like? It's us versus them. By the way, Hope Church is a spirit-filled church. We believe that the Bible teaches that the gifts of the Spirit are still available today. I couldn't imagine doing church without the Holy Spirit. I couldn't imagine going to Walmart without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but here's the, here's the challenge. There are good godly believers that know Jesus are going to go to heaven when they die, and they differ on this issue. What about modes and forms of water baptism? Do we baptize people forward? Do we baptize them backwards, or do we just sprinkle them? There are whole denominations formed over this. Do we have lights, bands, and LED walls, or, we do, or do we do the most holy thing? Do we just sing from hymnals and do away with all production? Now, some behaviors, listen to me, 
we know are wrong because the Bible is explicitly clear about them. We avoid these behaviors because the Lord condemns them. We embrace other behaviors because the Lord commands them. But some behaviors fall in the gray areas. You realize that? There are some things that you need answers for that you're going to have to fellowship with the Holy Spirit over because you can't find a chapter and a verse on that thing. So what do you do when you fall in the gray areas? How do we stay in unity? Well, I'm so glad you asked because the Bible speaks to this. So today we're going to look at some guiding principles and some personal reminders on fighting for unity. Number one, guiding principle number one accept one another, accept one another. Romans 14, verse one, Paul says, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. That needs to be somebody's life verse this morning. Verse two, for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience, underline that, I'll talk about that in a minute, will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. Why? For God has accepted them. He starts chapter 14 and ends this discourse in chapter 15, verse seven, by saying, accept each other. Paul is addressing two groups of people in the church at Rome, not carnivores versus vegetarians, but strong versus weak. The strong may not be the strong that you're thinking of. The weak may not be the weak that you're thinking of. The strong in their faith, according to the apostle Paul, were mature believers who understood their liberties in Christ. The weak in their faith, according to the Apostle Paul, immature believers who were bound by legalism and the law. But they both had a problem. They were arrogant because the weak criticized and condemned the strong for their liberty, while the strong despised and rejected the weak for their legalism. So they both took an adventure on missing the point. As you grow in the Lord, you develop deep convictions in your life that are forged by the word of God. You know the clear boundaries for your life. And when you step over that boundary, the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you reminds you that you've just grieved the Holy Spirit. So what you do is you repent of your sins and you come back. You also develop a conscience over time that moral compass in you. On those gray areas, you begin to ask the Lord, and as you fellowship with him, he begins to form some things that are right for you but may be wrong for your neighbor. That's the kind of liberty we have in Christ. According to Paul, the more mature you are in the Lord, the more liberty you have. The weaker you are, you'll die on that hill, and everything's a hill. And when that takes place on either side, when we roll our eyes at each other, when we're like, oh, bless your heart, you're going to get over that. Walk with God a little bit and that won't be a big deal. When we come to the table of relationship in the body of Christ with that mindset, we will not be united. And the Lord is after our unity in this season more than ever before because he's looking for salt and light in a decaying culture, and that's what he's called us to do. We honor God by honoring and accepting each other. What does that look like? It looks like bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I love the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I love to prophesy. If you've been around me, I just can't help it. I love it. I love to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. I love to see miracles break out in a place. I love the discerning of spirits giftings, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. I could go on and on. I don't know how you do life or the Great Commission without the gifts of the Spirit. But here's what I've realized, and I've said it before. I know people that can speak in the tongues of men and angels, but they're mean in their own native tongue. Here's what I'm impressed with as I grow in the Lord. 
is when the Lord convicts me and he shapes me and he bears fruit of the Holy Spirit inside of me that's not natural to me. It's not natural to love your enemy. It's not natural to love your Christian neighbor. And out of love comes joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You can't be patient without the Holy Spirit. Try it. See, God didn't just give us his word and say, do this. He gave us his commands, and then he dropped us into the laboratory called the local church where we get to practice and walk it out. And we have trouble, don't we, applying the word of God daily where there's friction and there's rubs. We have to fight for unity. Here's the deal. Every asset in the kingdom of God that's mismanaged becomes a liability, including our relationships. So we have to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We have to learn to submit a critical spirit to the Lord. I can be critical. I can find the one thing that's wrong. I can fail to celebrate the 52 things that we've done well and find that one thing that we got to work on. And it moves from just being the leader that finds things to improve on. And I develop a critical spirit. And then I pray Psalm 139, God, test me, try me. Is there anything in me that offends you? And he says, yes, there is. You've got a critical spirit. And you can either surrender that spirit to the Lord or you can walk in it and honor the enemy. Practice listening to understand instead of being understood. We have two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we speak. Proverbs says, even a fool is thought to be wise when he keeps his mouth shut. Everything you know right now, you shouldn't say. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit will say to you when you're in a room not talking and you're listening. And then finally, this is for the election year that we're in, we have to avoid winning arguments while losing unity in the household of faith. Paul would say to the church at Rome, remember that God has accepted you and the same grace that saved you is the same grace empowering you to fight for unity. If you'll embrace humility, take the lowest seat at the table and race for last, it'll be amazing the kind of unity that we come into. Paul is giving us this image in the first several verses of chapter 14 of God being a master and we being his servants. Now we know he no longer calls us servants, he calls us children. But he's still, friends, he still calls us servants because he modeled it for us, didn't he? He modeled that level of humility in the upper room where he took off his outer garment of power and he picked up a basin of water and he washed feet. And then he said, if I, your Lord, have washed your feet, you ought to wash the feet of other people. It's amazing the kind of unity we find in the body of Christ when we simply pick up a basin of water and a towel and we wash feet. Now, I want to say something that's really important, and it's this. Acceptance is not the same thing as inclusion or affirmation. Why do I clarify? Because there are many churches today that attempt to apply this principle by stating that they embrace inclusion theology, and are a, quote, affirming church, which means they're willing to accept any and all lifestyles, including LGBTQ+. There are some things that are very clear in the Bible that we have to rally around. People ask me from time to time, Pastor, I know someone that lives in an alternative lifestyle the things that we know are clearly prohibited in the scripture, are they welcome to worship at Hope Hope Church? And the answer is absolutely. We want them in the presence of the Lord. We'll welcome them, we'll hug them, we'll love them, we'll pray for them. But they will not be permitted to join this faith family. We'll be clear on the front end, the onboarding process called Inside Hope. Why? Because unity matters. We need to be very clear on what unites us and what doesn't. So we have a marriage statement in our Inside Hope manual. It's in our bylaws, and it simply says that there's only one kind of marriage that God ordains, blesses, and endorses, and it's between one man, one woman for one lifetime. That's it. 
But we don't stop there. In fact, we have a sexuality stance, and I want to read it to you. Sexuality and the divinely prescribed boundaries for the expression thereof is covered clearly in the Bible, which limits sexual expression to the marital relationship of one man and one woman. Homosexual acts, adultery, bestiality, and all forms of fornication are categorically condemned in the Bible. Furthermore, Hope Church believes that sexuality is assigned by God at birth, whatever that may be. The Bible does not permit an individual to alter their sexual identity physically or otherwise. This is not one of the gray areas. This is not just something to develop a conscience over. This is something we should be convicted about. So much so that we're going to take a whole series, our next series, called Wonderfully Made. It will be a biblical sexuality series. We're taking four weeks to unpack this. Why? Because our culture is confused and so are many in the body of Christ. We can't afford to not be clear on this issue. So the first guiding principle is that we accept each other. The second guiding principle is this. We encourage each other. If we stop with the first guiding principle, it'd be easy to think, you just stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane, let's leave each other alone and mind our own business. But that's not what God's called us to. We're not a business where we clock in and out. We're not relational tourists that just come in for a visit and we leave. We're the body, body of Christ. Every member is important. I can't point to where my pancreas is on my body, but I can tell you it's important. If it, if it were to stop working today, my body would be in trouble. We need every single one of you. We shouldn't just avoid tearing each other down. We're commanded to build each other up. It comes with sowing words, prophetic words, words of encouragement. When you're thinking about somebody at Hope Church, call them and start praying for them. Tell them you're thinking about them. People go in life as far as they're encouraged to go. It's amazing what will happen in your life when you sow a word of encouragement. You inject courage into someone. It matters that we accept each other, we welcome each other, we love each other, but we also encourage each other. The Bible is filled with one another scriptures, over a hundred in the New Testament. Love each other, serve each other, bear with each other your burdens, pray for each other. All those things matter because we are built by God to need each other. And Paul is shifting from a paradigm in chapter 14 of master servant to now brother and sister. There is this phileo love, this brotherly love that you see all through the New Testament that we're to engage in. So how do we do this? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to love your brother and sister in Christ like it is to love your biological brother or sister, but we're commanded to do that in Christ. Well, Paul gives us a few reminders, and I want to give those to you. Reminder number one, what you say and do affects other people. Amen. What you say and what you do affects other people. It really matters to the Lord. Romans 14, 13, and 15, Paul says, let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. I know and I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it's wrong, for that person, it's wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin, ruin someone for whom Christ died. This is one of the most difficult things to do in the body of Christ is to have the Holy Spirit permit you to do something in your life that he does not permit someone else to do. He forbids someone else to do. I heard Chuck Smith say this in a sermon one time uh, after the Jesus movement. They would go to the beach in California and there were some churches that were up in arms that he was going to the beach because he said, women are in, in bathing suits at the beach. They're, they're dressed inappropriately at the beach. And he said, bro, I'm going to the beach to surf. I'm not going to the beach to look at women. But if I had an issue with pornography or if lust was a temptation right now in my life or if I had a problem in my marriage, I would not go to the beach. 
So don't be pushing off your challenge and your issue right now because the Holy Spirit is forming a conscience and a conviction in you that he's not forming in me. And that's hard to do, isn't it? It's to the gray areas to still allow the Lord to develop something in you where he doesn't permit you to do something. And if you push past the boundary, it's sin. That's difficult. So the question is not how does this affect me, but how will this affect other people around me? 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Paul would say this to a very divided church, the church at Corinth. He said, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything's good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. One of the ways that we encourage other members of the body of Christ is that we choose to limit some of our freedoms for the sake of unity. We know we have freedom to do something, but I'm going to stay away from this, especially when I'm with them, because I know it's a snare for them. And I love them so much that I don't even want the appearance that would cause them to stumble and fall. What you do and say affects other people. Reminder number two, we must develop convictions and never violate our conscience. Romans 14, 16 through 23. Then you'll not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what you eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Your internal world in God affects how you live your life with other people. Verse 18, if you serve Christ with this attitude, you'll please God and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it's wrong to eat anything if it makes another person stumble. Verse 21, it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. You are not following your convictions if you do anything you believe is not right. You're sinning. So here Paul is talking about convictions and conscience. What is conscience? We'll start with that. It's the part of your heart and your mind that has been influenced by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. All of us, unbelievers and believers, have been gifted a conscience by God. There's an internal mechanism that tells you what is right and what is wrong. We've already talked about that in Romans. But as a spirit-filled Christian, this part of you, it's a part of you that the Holy Spirit partners with, and he shapes that. It's the part of you that knows and understands your particular moral compass. God has given us a conscience to guide our behavior in matters not clearly defined in the Bible. The Holy Spirit forms your conscience as you fellowship with him. As you fellowship with him and yield to him, he begins to shape your convictions through your conscience. I know some people that are like, Pastor, I'm totally against this. I don't feel like it's right because the Holy Spirit has done a work inside of me and I steer clear of these things. Even though you can't find chapter and verse. What is that? That's someone who's been formed by the Spirit of God and they now developed a conscience. And when they violate their conscience, they're in sin. Secondly, we have convictions. What is a conviction? I've already told you this morning. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a believer when there is a clear violation of God's word as clearly spelled out in his scripture. This is a work of the Holy Spirit and it's necessary for true repentance to take place. It's the prompting of the Holy Spirit that you've grieved him. It's also the development of deeply held beliefs that have been formed by the word of God through the spirit of God. I hear Christians all the time tell me things like this, especially as they're headed towards the election booths. They say, you know what? I really don't have a stance on abortion. You should. The Bible's clear on it. That's not a gray area. Well, Pastor, I really don't have a, a stance on Israel. You should. The Bible's very clear on it. I don't really have a stance on same-sex marriage. You should. The Bible's very clear on it. I don't really know about 
economic things and how we're to deal with the poor. You should. The Bible gives a lot of literary real estate to those issues. We're not forming a conscience over this. We're developing convictions over this because the word is clear about these issues. And I'm telling you in this season, we have to be accepting of the body of Christ. We have to stay away from needless arguments But we also have to be clear. To be unclear is to be unkind to the people you work with, the people you go to school with, your neighbors. When you're afraid that they're going to stiff arm you or you're going to lose the right to have dinner with them, when they ask you what you believe on a biblical issue, come on, we can't shy away from things that are controversial. The Bible deals with very political issues. And over the next several weeks and months from the pulpit at Hope Church, we're going to be incredibly clear, the clearest I know how to be on what the Bible says about these very relevant issues that we're facing right now. We can't afford not to be. I want to end this morning before I kick it to the campus and open our altars for healing prayer and things like that is that I I want to pray for our unity. If Jesus prayed his longest prayer that we would be one, I want to partner with him in praying about that. How about you? Can I invite you just to stand right now at your campus? Would you open your hands just in a posture of not having it all together, not knowing everything, being human? I heard it said recently that even the new man is still a human. That means we have flaws and we need help, don't we? We need the help of the Holy Spirit. Would you go ahead and ask him right now? Holy Spirit, would you help us? Help us answer the prayer that Jesus prayed, that we would be one, that we would fight for unity, that we would be such a force to be reckoned with in our culture and in our world because it would be clear that we're your disciples by the way we love each other, by the way we honor each other, by the way we accept each other, by the way that we limit some of the freedoms that we have because we in no way want to cause offense or to see one of our brothers or sisters stumble and fall. Holy Spirit, we ask for an impartation of your gifts, but we ask that you would do some deep work in our hearts in this season as we're moving towards November that we would be the people of God formed by the Spirit of God, that we would look like Jesus We'd sound like Jesus. We'd love like him. That's supernatural, God. We can't do it without you. So we invite you to help us. Help us to be clear. Help us to be bold. Oh, God, move in our nation. Move in our churches. The issues that matter to you, God, burn them in our hearts that we would be convicted that we wouldn't be so partisan that we couldn't be biblical. (laughs) Oh God, we'll give an account for how we vote. The apostles never dreamed that there would be a day in the future where citizens had the right to vote. They lived in a kingdom. But Lord, we live in a democratic republic and we get the choice, but we are also citizens of your kingdom and your kingdom culture should bear down on us as the most important culture that we submit to. Kingdom of heaven come, will of God be done in our hearts and our minds and may we see this nation come back to God like we've never seen before. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Simpsonville, Greenville, we love you. Spartanburg, great to be with you today. I want to kick the service back to the campuses right now. Spartanburg, I want to give you an opportunity. If you need to give your life to Jesus, if you need to confess maybe a sin or a hang up in your life and get freedom, maybe you need a word of encouragement today or want to know how to take a next step in this church family, I want to invite the ministry team to join me up here at this altar. And if you have a need in your life, physical healing, you need a sound mind, you need a marriage restored, you need a financial breakthrough, 
Let the touch of God come upon you before you get in that car and go home today. Amen. God bless you. Have an incredible afternoon. We'll see you very soon. We love you.